Oh, I've been doing this now for over six years, six flipping years. And frankly, I feel like this channel has earned a bigger audience than it gets. It deserves a bigger audience than it gets. And I've been racking my brain trying to figure out what I could do. What? 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 And, and I, th I think I finally put my finger on it. You know, we live in a very internet-driven world. And it's all about quick, buzzy, catchy things that can catch fire and, as the kids say, go viral on social media. So, I've come up with something that I think can get the folks talking on the tweeter. That's right. I'm hip. I'm with it. If somebody asked me how to describe the Royal Rumble, I'll tell you what I'll say. Hashtag Royal Rumble in four words. Now that, that's going to blow up the tweeter. And that's going to make the people go crazy. And that's what's going to do it. It's got to. Now, I wonder what some of the people might say if they had to hashtag Royal Rumble in four words. Who rent, rent, no, Keith Orton. Fuck you, John Cena. Fuck you, Braun Strowman. You, Braun Strowman. Fuck you, Roman Reigns. Bait the oil all around. Kenny Omega fucking rules on it. That'll do it. That's gonna be the hit on Twitter. That makes the people go crazy. Maybe, maybe not. Only time will tell. But in the meantime, let's talk about the 2017 Royal Rumble. Heading into this Royal Rumble, I had a few concerns. Number one, it was gonna be in the Alamo Dome. And was this ultimately going to be the type of event, a show that needed a stadium? Are we going to end up more so with a stadium that needed a show? Now, I was really concerned when on Raw, Roman Reigns was pumping up the fact that 40,000 people were going to be there at the Rumble on Sunday. I'm sitting there saying, whoa, 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 pump the brakes. We had over 60,000 back in 1997. I don't think the capacity of the Alamo Dome has changed that much. Uh, we ultimately got, you know, just a shade over 50,000, it sounds like. Uh, they must have really kicked it into giveaway mode the last week. It got crazy on the comps in order to get the people to come to that amount. And that still means there were potentially thousands of empty seats. And you can sit there and defend it and talk about uh, the fact that the setup and where they had the ramp and everything, whatever you want to believe. But I will at least say this felt like a big league show, which is ultimately the goal of the WWE um, is to make this feel like a big four and make the big four feel different, which we most certainly need considering we have almost two pay-per-views every damn month. So these big important shows need to stand out and be different. I don't know if we need a two-hour pre-show. And I know many of you will sit there and say, well, I don't watch anyway, so who cares? This time I actually did. Again, I wish I hadn't. I don't know why. I don't know why Peter Rosenberg is on the fucking panel. The fuck does he know why the fuck? fuck do we care about him but furthermore you've got three matches on the pre-show it's whatever only five on the main show but three on the pre-show there's no better way to make us not give a flying flip about the people in the matches or the matches themselves than to have commercial breaks during the matches is one thing if you do it on television because that's kind of a requirement for being on tv especially for three hours on raw and even for two hours on smackdown but these are the big events and this is a big big event and you're taking breaks during the matches. What better way to say that these matches that happen on the pre-show don't fucking matter? That's ridiculous. And then in general, I was really concerned about the fact that you were going to have four hours potentially to fill and only five matches to fill it with. That means either A, there was going to be a lot of filler crap or some unannounced, unadvertised crap that did nothing for the show or the matches were going to go way too damn long. Now, the WWE tried to compensate in some ways by having it be two minutes between the entrance for the Rumble. And I have to say, I thought that was going to be crappy heading into it, but it actually worked. If for no other reason than the fact that the ramp was freaking three miles long and you had to get the fat boys up on the carts to be able to drive them down, I actually thought the tempo of the Rumble being two minutes in between worked this time. I, I thought it did. I was wrong about that. But still, you know, we get to the point of the Rumble 
and it's not even 9.30 Eastern time, that still means there's close to an hour and a half of show left. That's horrible. Just too damn much, which epitomizes WWE Today. Just too much product. We don't need two hours of pre-show plus four hours, and then on top of that, the four hours, you've only got five featured matches. And especially when you roll into it and you say most of the show felt relatively predictable, it's a wonder why people don't care about these types of events, even like the Royal Rumble, nearly as much as they used to. Anyways, let's get on to the matches, and there's only five of them, so there's not a ton to talk about. Let's dive right in. I'm going to start you off with the math equation. Unfortunately, not Scott Steiner-esque, but I will do my best. What happens when you get two overrated, limited, in my opinion, performers, two characters that I don't like, added to a match that I've seen before, with way too much time to fill, and with no doubt who would win? That all equals a mediocre Raw Women's Championship match. I'm sorry. On the one hand, you look at it, you should have, in theory, a clearly defined face and a clearly defined heel. But unfortunately, when you talk about good matches, one of the things good matches should do, in my opinion, is give you that ability to suspend your disbelief. At no point in time in this match did I think that Bailey had any chance in hell of winning. At no point in time did I believe that she was going to end up actually winning this match. And now you've had penis power go over clean. Why the hell would I want to see this match again when I've seen it before? And I don't care about the performers. I don't care about the characters. And there was nothing added to the story. At least if you would have really involved Stephanie or done something significant. I get it. There's a reason for it to continue. But there is no more story here. There is no saga. This was just a mediocre opening to this show. Period. Yes. I know I said the time had come, but to debut now would just be done. I'm sure you're mad, the same old fucks won. Don't bitch on Twitter, wrestling's supposed to be fun. I'm sorry to have to make you wait. Don't you worry, my work will be great. Pretty soon, it will be plain to see. You will come to worship the shattered schleg daddy. Yes. Now, when it comes to the WWE Universal Championship match, I have a feeling that a good number of you actually like this, and here's several reasons why. Number one, it involved Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho, so you like that. Number two, it had the feeling like it was an Attitude Era title match. Minus the interesting, compelling, unique characters and the story to go along with it, but there were elements of the match that felt like kind of that crash test dummy TV crap of the late 90s, early 2000s. Some of you probably were happy because no matter what, this was the signal of the end of this ever-loving, never-ending frickin' feud, and I get that. Some of you surely were really happy that Braun Strowman interfered, but let's face it, most of you liked this match because you got a lot of spots and Roman Reigns fucking lost. And it's that simple. And I see all the reasons why, and that's what it boils down to. But I really did not like this match. And it has very little to do with Roman Reigns losing, so get that out of your damn mind. This is something that's happened too many times to care. Like, I've seen Kevin Owens versus Roman Reigns, Kevin Owens versus Roman Reigns tag matches with Jericho and Owens versus Roman Reigns and Rollins or somebody else. These guys have faced off so many damn times. Why the hell would I care about this now, especially at a big four show for the title? I don't. On top of that, when these guys are sitting there and doing all this crazy shit, borderline killing each other for no real reason in my mind, because the story had not built up to that point where it necessitated this type of match, why in the hell do we have Jericho dangling above the shark cage when the only thing he does is throw down brass knucks, and then when Owens uses the brass knucks, Roman kicks out at two any damn ways. It was a completely pointless stipulation. The purpose of doing a shark cage match like that was to, back in the day, have a regular wrestling match. Maybe it gets a little more extreme, but finally the babyface 
gets to get even with the heel without any cheating or shenanigans or interference. But the problem is, is the fans want to cheer Owens, even though he's supposed to be the heel, because he stinks at getting over as a heel. You've got Roman Reigns, who's supposed to be the babyface, but he's getting booed because he flat out sucks at being a fucking babyface. So the whole dynamics of this are all screwed up. And Jericho getting involved, like the brass knucks, after these guys are going through pyramids of chairs and freaking tables off the top rope and all this other crap, why the hell would I care about any brass knucks? Too much extreme shit. On top of that, if you're going to go with this whole Braun Strowman crap, then why not interject Triple H and Seth Rollins here? It was Kevin Owens who was Triple H's chosen one. So why not have Triple H come out and try to fuck over Roman Reigns, because that makes sense. And then Seth Rollins comes out to help his shield, brethren, but more so get back at Triple H because he used to be the chosen one of God himself. And that makes sense. And then maybe after all of that, then Braun Strowman comes out. If you want to get nuts, then brother, let's get nuts. Instead of just sitting there and ha after all this shit. Now it's Braun Strowman comes out. You still made Kevin Owens look like a fucking weak-ass bitch champion because he did all the shit to Roman Reigns. He hit him with freaking brass knucks. He put him through tables. And the only way he could win was because of somebody that was even more physically impressive walking in and just dismantling Roman Reigns just like fucking that. And on top of all of that... It does nothing to make Roman Reigns look vulnerable. It looks like some Cena 2.0 bullshit. And it means that at least for another couple of weeks, this godforsaken, horrible-ass universal title reign of Kevin Owens is going to continue. No, I suppose a lot of you nerds are happy. Well, then that's all right. You have your little moral victory. Because Roman's bigger than that crappy universal title anyways. Then Taker, you mess with this Samoa instead, you're gonna get the fist, bitch. But first things first, that bitch called Braun Strowman. Be careful what you wish for, you roided up looking knucklehead, because Roman's gonna fuck you up. When he's done with you, you might as well change your Tinder pick to hamburger meat, because that's what your face is gonna look like, hamburger meat. Because Roman Reigns rules, bitches. Hell yeah, bitches. 2017, like it or not, will be the year of Roman Reigns. Oh, my Samoan stud muffin. Roman, love you. Love you, Roman. Now, Nike. Love you. Call me Roman. Ron Strowman is a beast. And if Roman Reigns has a problem with that, he will yoke him up. And if you have a problem with that, I will yoke you up. And especially if that big nose beagle Summer has got a problem with that, I will yoke her up too. Quick, quick. The cruiserweight division is exactly what the fuck I thought it was going to be, especially with it being on Raw and having Vince McMahon and Kevin Dunn really involved. I tried to fucking warn you. I tried to tell you, idiots. Well, ding dong, dumb dicks. This crap is lame. But I've crapped on the cruiserweight division concept being on Raw enough. What I just don't understand is this. Is if you're going to have these dudes, then give them a chance to shine. You're sitting there and you have these guys that have worked a certain type of way for so many years to get to this point. Now that they've gotten to this point, you want them to do everything other than what actually got them a following and got them to this moment in time, got them this opportunity. Why would you intentionally sabotage talent? Because that's exactly what the hell this is. Look, there are plenty of guys on the WWE roster, Raw, SmackDown, that I think stink, that I personally wouldn't want anything to fucking do with. But if I've brought them in and I've got them, then my God, as a businessman, I want to do everything I possibly can to get these dudes over so that way, ding dong, dumb dicks, we could actually try and make some money with them. Because if you can't make money with them, why in the hell do you have them? And it's a shame. Because I see a guy like Neville, and he should be the face of an interesting and compelling cruiserweight division. It's cool he won, but who gives a shit about this division? The thing I have to say, when you see AJ Styles, John Cena, in the same ring, Sometimes things just naturally come together, and they just naturally work, and they just naturally make sense on so many different levels. 
you'll laugh at the comparison, but another WWE comparison in recent times that I think of is The Miz and Daniel Bryan. It just works on so many different levels, and you really don't have to do a lot to really, really make it work. And that's the same thing with AJ Styles and John Cena, because in so many ways, the story tells itself. So when these two get in the ring together, and they've wrestled each other before, mind you, on pay-per-view, it feels like a big deal. It feels like a big league match. It's the closest thing to a big fight feel that they get out of somebody on that roster that isn't a Taker or a Lesnar or a Goldberg, or to a lesser degree, a Triple H. I mean, AJ Styles, John Cena, actually, that feels more big fight than some of the matches involving some of those guys, like Taker when he faces Bray Wyatt, or Brock Lesnar when he faced Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. I mean, this feels big league. Just imagine if the company hadn't rushed into it and did it as some slam or whatever and did it again. Imagine if this was saved for a WrestleMania. Imagine if you'd have done this last year heading into WrestleMania. And it was first time ever. No titles. It's just about pride. It's about ego. Who the better man is. What would happen in a match. AJ Styles, John Cena. And honestly, you see these two guys in the ring, and they actually have really good chemistry. And even though there are elements of this where you could still see that Cena doesn't know how to sell his way out of a paper fucking bag, the way he pieces a match together makes no fucking sense, AJ Styles does all of this, and then you just literally sprint out of fucking nowhere and start doing your lame-ass shoulder blocks. Even Warrior understood the art of the sell-no-sell. Hogan understood the art of the sell-no-sell. -sell. These guys built up to this. Like Cena just instantly nuts. Like a 14-year-old with his first taste of PP pee in the VJJ. It's ridiculous. But as this match was going on, I can't lie, I really, really got into it. I got kind of pumped for it. Not because the action was so great. But it was all because it was building to the finish. And what I knew was coming. And the moment at hand was here. Finally, 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 the wait was finally over. And I love it. And I needed it. And the funny thing is, is I want it more. Ah, ah. You want some math? Here's another math equation for you. What is AJ Styles plus John Cena plus a third match plus the Royal Rumble plus a WWE Championship bout equal? It equals 16 time champ, bitch. Oh, the majesty of no matter how much you think ch things might change or no matter how much things might be different, it always comes back to the same folks. It's always about the same people. And more importantly for me, it might be bad for you, but it is money for me. With this glorious victory, by the egomaniac himself, John Cena, we are halfway, halfway, halfway to my WrestleMania world title dream match. And it would ultimately be up to the Royal Rumble match to deliver that dream to me. Then we get to the moment where dreams can happen. Where dreams live forever. The Royal Rumble match. And as I've talked about before, you know, WrestleMania is the granddaddy of them all when it comes to wrestling, sports entertainment, whatever the hell you want to call it. For WWE, big shows, that's the biggest. One of my favorite single match of the year is the Royal Rumble match. So, no matter what, the Rumble is still the Rumble. And even someday, if I don't watch this crap anymore, there will probably still be, out of habit, two shows that I choose to watch every year. That's going to be the Royal Rumble, and that is WrestleMania. It's just the way it is. It's kind of like ingrained in our wrestling culture. But as it dawned on me, the setup that they had, I saw that three mile long rap and I wondered how some of the big dudes, the fat boys, uh, were going to get down to the ring and in particular how they were going to do Taker. Holy Christ. <laughs> I love the golf cart they had for the fat boys. It was reminiscent of WrestleMania 3 and the Pontiac Silverdome. Or if he asked Hulk Hogan, brother, he'd probably say the Pontiac Superdome. Anyways, let's talk about some of the shit that really struck me and what happened in this actual Royal Rumble match that lasted well over an hour. Uh, the two minutes between entrants, like I said, I thought worked. It was actually a success for this match. Because if it would have been a minute and a half, it would have felt like it was too much 
of one on top of the other, and you could never really allow anything to manifest or happen. It had to be two minutes. But first, it's always good to see Mark Henry. Apparently, somebody over at the In the Rope show thought differently. And let me tell you something. You want to be sons of bitches. In the Rope show. Mind you, the only reason you exist is because of the Off the Rope show, period. Because you were marks for us, and you wanted to emulate us, and imitate us, and do a crappy job of it, mind you. The one guy, whatever the hell his name is, he wants to be me. <laughs> Bitch, please. The one big boy wants to be Triple T, but he can't be tasteless like old great Tony T. He doesn't have that rapist wit like Tony T. And the third guy, whenever he bothers to show up, he does everything other than what Mikey used to be able to do, which was get you to go hashtag gay for route. And he, they dare sit there and insult Mark Henry? Mark Henry! The fuck is wrong with you? If all that time you were watching this channel and you were listening to the magnificence of the prophet of sexual chocolate that was Smokey, did he not teach you about how great Mark Henry was? And how much everybody should want to be like Mark motherfucking Henry. And you're going to shit on Mark Henry? Well, we, sir, all of us, we shit on you. How dare you besmirch that man? How dare you besmirch the legacy of a cat? Lord, rest his soul, rest in peace in the big cheeseburger factory in the sky. Who could get more stuff over in his litter box than you ever could on your fucking channel? How dare you, sir? How dare you? And frankly, it's almost worth its own video. Except you guys aren't worth it. So here's to ya. Don't fucking talk about Mark Henry. Fuck you. Mark Henry's that dude. But anyways, on to things that actually matter that aren't the end of rope show because they do not matter. You know, early on, you're sitting there and you see Braun Strowman, and you're like, oh god, here comes the big monster thing. They're probably going to have him eliminate 18 dudes, and he's going to face off with Lesnar and Goldberg and Taker and all that shit, and then all that shit didn't happen. You have Braun come in early, be dominant early, to get eliminated by Baron fucking Corbin. And then once he does get eliminated by Baron Corbin, he just looks up at him and then eventually fucking leaves. Braun Strowman, who just interfered in the, the Universal title match early in the night, Especially if you were going to end up having Roman in this Rumble match, why in the hell wouldn't you let Roman get his hands on him there? Furthermore, if Braun Strowman is a guy that's supposed to give no fucks and he's supposed to be some big monster, what the hell would he care if he just got eliminated? His first response should have been immediately go in there and yoke the fuck up out of Baron Corbin. This is why the WWE can't do shit right and can't get right. It's because of bullshit like this. Why? So you either A, don't follow up on this at all, and this ends up being nothing in the grand scheme of things, or B, we get a Raw vs. SmackDown monster match at WrestleMania, Braun Strowman and Baron Corbin. Ah, what a waste of fucking time with all that shit you did as Strowman in this damn Rumble match just to have Corbin eliminate him, and then Corbin make no other real impact. It would have been one thing if Corbin lasted to like the final three or the final four, but he didn't. This was not some big launching point. This was just stupid. And overall, this Royal Rumble, with the lack of surprise entrance, which was striking and stunning. You know, I saw people beforehand talking about how they were going to get rid of, you know, the, a lot of the jobbers in the waste of space. The first 20 people, for the most part, this felt like a jobber battle royal. It felt like a waste of space. It felt like some crap you would put on the one-hour main event of SmackDown. This is supposed to be the Royal fucking Rumble. And the first two-thirds of it were incredibly fucking lame. Absolutely lame. Whoever pieced together the first two-thirds of this match should be goddamn ashamed of themselves. And then we haven't even gotten to the squirrely shit. And frankly, if it comes to the Rumble match itself, I can understand if a lot of people didn't like this. Because this was squirrely as fuck. Not only the whole thing of having Braun Strowman be a monster early on just to eliminate... Did by Baron Corbin for some random fucking reason. But then you've got Luke Harper grows a set. Looks like he's going to fight back. But it's Bray Wyatt that ends up lasting longer. Bray Wyatt that goes on to the final three. For what reason? I know not fucking why. Don't sit there and put the rocket ship up his ass like we're supposed to give a fuck about him now. 
What, he's going to win the world title in February? Bitch can't even win a Mania match. Get the fuck out of here. Then we have Goldberg go over on Lesnar again really quickly with the elimination. And, and while it's kind of funny and it's kind of interesting, on the other hand, at some point in time, you run the risk of people starting to get pissed at Goldberg and you're starting to get sympathy behind Lesnar. And that's not the way you want to feature Goldberg. And that's not the way you want to feature Lesnar. And that's not the way you want the people to react to Lesnar. You don't want your big dominant monster coming across as a sympathetic figure. It just doesn't fucking work. And then on top of that, you tease the stare down between Goldberg and Taker. And I understand it was inevitable, especially with them in the match, but there should have been a Lesnar-Taker stare down as well. Furthermore, when you do this with Taker and Goldberg, if you're not going to go there, then don't go there. If these two are not going to wrestle at Fastlane, if these two are not going to wrestle at WrestleMania, I understand the whole thing about moment in time and selling this, but you go with it long enough, you sell the idea to people that this could actually happen, and therefore you plant the seed in the people's minds that this is what they actually want to happen, knowing you're going in two tied, totally divergent different paths with both Goldberg and The Undertaker. You're undercutting yourself, and it's ridiculous. And then Roman Reigns comes out at number 30, and that's a subject in and of itself. But instead of immediately going after Chris Jericho, who didn't do shit in the whole fucking rumble, but he's there for like a freaking hour, and trying to get revenge of being pissed off about the fact that Kevin Owens won the title, or kept the title, and on top of that, there's no Braun Strowman there, because why the fuck would you keep him around all that time so that way Roman could get some type of revenge on him? Instead of going after Jericho, he's going after fucking The Undertaker. You couldn't beat Kevin Owens, and now you want the dude that's only lost once in history at WrestleMania? And then you have Roman Reigns eliminate The Undertaker, and he survives to the final two. It's one thing if you're going to go with some big, massive heel turn, which ultimately, in today's wrestling business, eventually means a babyface turn, because the heroes are the villains, and the villains are the heroes, and I've talked about this ad nauseum. It's like when people talk about a Cena heel turn, he already is a fucking heel, you idiots. Roman Reigns heel turn, he already is a heel, you idiots. But if you're not going to do some type of seismic character change with him and you're actually going to continue to fight against it and try to insist that people should like him, now you're sending him up against the fucking GOAT? You're sending him up against the real, true WrestleMania? Fuck all you Shawn Michaels bitch boys. You're sending him up against the dude that is the standard bearer, the franchise, the epitome of WWE in the good. And like I said, the GOAT, the Undertaker. And you think this is going to work? You're in San Antonio. A lot of people probably wanted Taker to win. It would have really helped this show if Taker maybe in theory would have won. Or at least, if nothing else, if he would have eliminated Roman Reigns. I understand the whole thing of sending the young lion at him and you needed some type of opponent for The Undertaker. But of course Vince would fucking change his mind. You have the chance to do Undertaker John Cena. Limited amount of times you have Undertaker at WrestleMania. While there's another dream for me with Cena involving WrestleMania, I could have put that dream on the side because that could happen at any year down the road. Undertaker John Cena has very few possibilities to happen. It's there. So many of the stars have aligned. And Vince McMahon is a fucking moron and doesn't go there. He deserves whatever the fuck he gets with Roman Reigns and Undertaker at WrestleMania, period. But then, looking past all this, and there's plenty of time to rant about that going forward. Something ma magical happened. Something glorious happened. And while, yes, I would have really liked Taker to win, and I thought that would have been great, and I really feel like The Undertaker versus John Cena for the WWE Championship at WrestleMania 33 would have been a true main event WrestleMania match. Oh, baby. What I got was really damn good. After so many years, you've had two guys for the past decade that have really truly been the face of the WWE, the two gold standards, the two standard bearers. And after all of these years, match after match after match, program after program after program, feud after feud after feud, the one thing we've never gotten was Randy Orton versus John Cena one-on-one -on -one at WrestleMania. Just think about how stupid that is. We got Hogan Andre, Hogan Savage, Hogan Warrior. We got Brett versus Sean. Brett versus Austin. Sean versus Austin. We got freaking 
Austin versus The Rock three times. We got God versus Taker three times. In all of these years, nobody in that company has ever thought just one time it would make sense to have the two standard bearers of the past decade go one-on-one -on -one against each other at WrestleMania. Oh, oh, oh. But you can. But you can. And don't you dare screw it up. I cannot explain the pure rapture and joy as I just watched Roman Reigns be eliminated by that construction beard growing, sleeve tattoo having, baby oil lathering, raging ring owner, viper son of a bitch, Randall Keith Orton, be the last survivor of the Royal Rumble. It's this close to and I can taste it. Oh, and I want it. I want it bad. I want it real bad. And you know, deep down, you, 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 you want it too. It can finally happen. Randy Orton versus John Cena, one on one, for the whole WWE Championship at WrestleMania. Some of y'all splooge to Kenny Omega versus Okada. This, ladies and gentlemen, this is what sports entertainment is all about. This is the epitome of splooge-worthy. So nice, we did it 900 times, but this time, it counts. Oh, the WWE better not fuck this up with that stupid no shower and no shaving motherfucker. Pray quiet. Randy Orton versus John Cena can happen at WrestleMania. It has to happen. It needs to happen. And we must will it to happen. Now we come to that moment in hand. What did the Schleich Daddy ultimately think about the 2017 Royal Rumble? And, you know, I look at it this way. Four hours of main card is just too damn much for me to plow through. Especially with only five matches. That means you're requiring me to keep my attention span for extended periods of time, for a lot of crap that I don't really care about to get to the one match that I truly honestly did, which was the Rumble. I ended up caring more about Cena and Styles grant you, but at the end of the day, this was a one-match show for me. You know, that's how the Rumble usually is. It's just too long, and you need more to break up the monotony of a match, 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 match. But this show is really hard for me to grade now. Because of what they did on this show, there are so many things they could do between now and Mania. The grading on this is really a to-be-determined. What did they do with Taker and Roman Reigns? Do they screw up the golden goose that they have with Orton versus Cena at WrestleMania? Um, do they try to inject Bray Wyatt in there? You know, what are they going to do? Are they going to have Goldberg win the belt from Owens at the next pay-per-view? And that's the launching point for Owens Jericho for the U.S. title. Lesnar Goldberg for the Universal title, and that's main eventing. I mean, ugh. you know, I was really looking to this show to really get me set up to really get excited about WrestleMania 33. And at the end of the day, we'll 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 see. That's the best way I can put it. But but I'll leave you with this. I look at this year's show, and I do think there is potential and there is possibility. You've got The Undertaker, Goldberg, Lesnar, God, Randy Orton, John Cena. They're all in the featured money matches at this year's show. I got to tell you flat out, this year's WrestleMania has loads of potential. In fact, I think WrestleMania 20 is going to be epic. But it's 2017. And we're not talking about WrestleMania 20. We're talking about WrestleMania 33. At the end of the day, no matter how much shit changes, always remember, it always comes back to the same. And what really matters the most when all is said and done is that the Breakfast Club rules, bitches.